to introduce Charles Hoverbrooks. Uh, if you don't mind, can I say just a small story? Say what you must. <laughs> <laughs> you might not want to do that. <laughs> no, just joking. Listen, when I first became an Adventist, I was uh, baptized and I was going to the Delta Church. And um, the music that I used to listen to before I came to the church um, was definitely different from what they played in the church. So, um, it took a while to sit through the worship services and listen to what we sang out of the books. But you came to that church and you did a program there. And when I heard him sing, I started to realize how beautiful Christian music was. Because I was kind of missing the music I used to listen to. But when I heard him sing, and I heard how you love Jesus Christ, uh, it, it helped me a lot. I mean, it helped me a lot to number one, stay in the church and actually love Christian music. So listen. All right, buddy. Thank you, sir. Okay. Yes. Listen, at the end of the service, very important, at the end of the service, we are going to take up a love offering. We'll have two deacons by the door, so please um, support him, not only with your prayers, but also with your mouth. Yes. Hey, Father. Yes, you can turn this one over here. I'll work with this one. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. morning. Y'all know you can be somewhere else today, but you're right here in the house of God. And that speaks volumes. And uh, I was asking God all week, what kind of message can I bring in song to everyone here this morning? What message in song? And I selected five songs as I felt I was being prompted by the Holy Spirit to select these five songs. And uh, But as I stepped through the door and heard the first message of the... Um, of the Sabbath school lesson, my mind began to be pricked again. I was saying, oh Lord, what are you saying here? <laughs> you gotta go, I gotta go in that direction? I said, no, but if I go in that direction, how can, if you led me for the one that you have selected, and now I'm being prompted for this, you don't vacillate like that. So how can I do two in 30 minutes? Two presentations at your prompting. We'll give you all the time you want. <laughs> no, that's not fair. And so I, so I kind of like dismissed it. You never dismiss God because God will continue to prick your yes. conscience. Yes. And uh, I was hearing the prayers and the requests. I was like, ooh, wait a minute. And then this sister back here that had the friend that was so energetic and said, I don't want to have to go through the time of trouble. Remember when you said that? And God said, now you're going to have to deal with it. <laughs> you're going to have to deal with it. For folks, for seven years now, and it's always God's number, seven years to this day, God put a burden on my heart, a message on my heart so deeply that I went from Genesis to Revelation researching how to document it. And I want to present that, but God is saying, you present both. When? Today? In the morning hours? And the other part at 445. So, but because I would invite you to come out to the 445, hear that other side of it. But it's expedient that we focus on this theme here because it is a prelude to everything. Apart from this, the love of God, we have not a leg to stand on. Amen. We're all here because of the love of God. Amen. What is it you just read that God so Love. love this world that he gave his only begotten son. That God's love for us is serious, folks. Amen. It is very serious. So much that he'll take it all the way to Calvary Amen. for us. He would rather die than spend eternity Amen. without us. Amen. That's some serious love. No greater love than this. That a man will lay down his life for his friend is what he says. So I want to deal with that. And that is the prelude for this afternoon, which is broader because everything develops on that theme of love. Every single thing from Genesis to Revelation is nothing more than a revelation of the love of God. Amen. And there we have within our body of believers an inspired commentary. What is that? 
Very Spirit of prophecy. All it is is an inspired commentary. It is not extra biblical. It is simply an inspired commentary on the Bible. Five books. We called it the what? Conflict, Conflict series. The first of those books are then then this. Wait, hold on. Desire of Ages. Yes. It's important you go in sequence. Then Desire of Ages because it's telling a story of the Bible. Yes. It's important because the Patriarchs and Prophets taught you from the conflict in yes. heaven clear through to Deuteronomy all the way over to uh, Judges and uh, Kings. And then Prophets and Kings start from there. And then it goes all the way to the end of Malachi <coughs> into the three of the four Gospels, and that's manifest in the book called uh, Desire of Ages. And if you really want to see the inspiration of that inspired commentary, look at the bottom of each of those chapters. And it would say this is based on Matthew yes. 1. And, and so you, you read the Bible. Matthew 1. Put the Bible here. And then take Desire of Ages and read that chapter you will be blown away. Yeah. I'm serious, folks. That is some serious interpretation, a serious commentary. So that's the third. We say Patriots and Prophets, Prophets and Kings, and then we have those four Gospels, which is Desire of Ages. Then, yes. the Acts of the Apostles, taking you from the Acts to what? All the way to, start with a J, Jude and Revelation. And then the fifth book is the Great Controversy, which is from A.D. 31 through to and then beyond. You see that? A.D. 31. Why do I say A.D. 31? What happened in A.D. 31? Christ was crucified. But before he was crucified, he gave us a prophetic look, a dual prophecy. The fate of Jerusalem as it is compared with the fate of the world. A twofold prophecy. You'll find it in Matthew 24. The whole chapter. Read the two verses before because you get a sense of continuity and context to that. It's critical to understand that. So then we come to the Acts of the Apostles and then the fifth one. The Great Controversy. And it takes from AD 31 all the way to the end of this world. Which we began. Please read it folks. You got a great controversy club? Please wear it out. Wear it out. <laughs> and then it takes it to the end of the 7,000th year, which is what we call the millennium. That's what it does. What's the first sentence of patriots and prophets? God is love. What? God is love. God is love. And we take that theme throughout patriots and prophets and go to prophets and kings. Then we come to the desire of ages. Then we come to Acts, and then we come to Revelation and the Great Controversy. What's the last sentence in the Great Controversy? It says, from the minutest atom to illimitable space, all things, animate and inanimate, declares that God is love. Go ahead and run this, sir. We'll deal with that thing right now because if you don't start with that, folks, we're going to have a problem. Amen. Go ahead, Gary. And while this song is going, bring it down a bit. John 3. 1 John 3. First verse. And then we'll deal with that after this song. Bring it up a little bit. Oh. 
we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Why won't the rest of the world be able to look on Jesus? But some people will be able to look on him. Because we will be like him. Why would we be able to look on him? Because we will be like him. Remember Moses going up into the mountain? How many days did he spend with him? Forty. Forty days. Came back down off of the mountain. What happened? His whole face was lit up like the sun. Just like the sun. The people were saying, Moses, we can't stand to look at that face. Do something about it, man. You're going to kill us with it. Put a veil on it. So we can stand and look at it. The man had become transformed into the same likeness as God and Jesus simply because he was beholding his glory. You become just like whoever you hang with. Whoever you hang with, that's, how, that's who you're going to become like. By beholding, we become changed, we become transformed. Moses was up there hanging with God. For 40 days, he came down, he had that light all over him. Amen. He didn't want to blow the people away. But he just, that was just a natural what? Transformation. And the Bible just said that when Jesus comes in the clouds and all of his glory, just as the light and shine from the east, even to the west, and it's going to be splendid because the wicked will be struck down by the brightness of his coming, according to 2 Thessalonians, the second chapter, right? But we'll be able to look up at him. Why? Hallelujah. We'll be like him, not only in outward glory, but what? We're not only sons of light and daughters of light, but we'll be like him in Our character. Mm -hmm. And this is what the Bible says that we're waiting for the sons and daughters of God to be what? Manifest. Character. It's the only thing that we're going to be able to take from down here to up there. An attitude like that of Jesus. After, after the divine similitude of Jesus. Character. Why? Because it was a lack of character that got us into this mess in the first place. Somebody wanted to exalt himself above God. I want to be like the most high. That's Lucifer. You know he didn't want to be like the Most High. Because if he wanted to be like the Most High in character, then he would take the lower position and not exalt himself. He wanted his power. He wanted his authority. He wanted his, you know, uh, his, his, his claim for glory. Fame, power, position, mind. Y'all look at me. I want your what? Your worship. Let me pump myself up. I'm the, I'm the top dog. I'm number one. That was a bad attitude. That was not like Jesus. If you want to find out the character of Jesus, you look at John 3.16. By beholding him on that cross, you see every attribute of God. Because no greater love than this than the man who laid out his life. Jesus' love for us is serious love. And it's a character like that that he wants up in heaven. We can't get up there in heaven thinking and acting like we do down here. We're going to start this whole mess all over again, we won't be safe to be saved. God said, yo, we've got to have an attitude like Jesus. When you exalt people, esteem others better than yourself. Don't be so quick to get the glory for yourself. Give glory to God and esteem others better than yourself. And that's the only way we can avoid this thing repeating. I will be like the most high. I, I, I. No, we should have an E-Y-E -E focus on Jesus, not an I, because it doesn't focus on Jesus. Pronoun I doesn't focus on Jesus. Pronoun I, letter I, focus on me. me. I, I will be like that. You spell sin. Spell it. S, I, N. What's the middle of sin? I. You can't have sin without it. You cannot have sin without I. That's the wrong I. The E, Y, E is what we should focus on. Let us run the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, who is the what? Author and the finisher of our faith. When you do, you'll be changed. The sin that the devil put in you is going to come out. 
It has to come out. Remember the wilderness journey? The snakes were biting the people. And the poison was in. That's the devil putting his what? Sin inside of our blood, which is our life, and killing us. But when Jesus was lifted up on that cross, everyone that looked at that serpent on the pole, the sin was extracted and cast upon the what? The serpent. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all that sin out of you. Transform you. That's the only thing we can take from down here to up there. And when the character of Christ had been perfectly reproduced in his if then he will come. Remember that in the spirit of prophecy? Yes. So that we just read it in 1 John 3, the first verse. We'll be able to look at him. We'll be able to look upon him. Why? Because we will be like him. He's waiting for the sons of God to be manifest. Because the, the, the lie out in the universe is they can't. They can't love. And all the law is is what? Love. The law, the Ten Commandments, is simply a transcript of God's character. They can't do it down there. Lucifer said to God, they want to be number one. Everybody want to exalt themselves. Every team wants to be number one. They don't want to play the second fiddle, and I don't either, and they don't. They can't do it. But at the end of the age, there are going to be some people that are going to say they exalt others and esteem others greater than themselves. You should do well, folks, to read second chapter of Philippians. It is in mark, stark contrast to Isaiah 14 and Isaiah 28. Complete opposite. Compare Isaiah 14 to the account of Lucifer and Ezekiel 28 with Philippians 2. You see character of the devil, then you see the character of God. God is love, all love. He is also omnipotent. He's meaning he's omni, omni, all power. Omniscient, all knowledge. All um, um, omnipresent, right? Omnipresent. I'm everywhere. God says, I'm in the past now. I'm Alpha. He didn't say, I'm a Muslim, but a time Alpha, did he? He said, I am Alpha. That means he's there now. Right. He's seeing everything. He's omnipresent. He's in the past now. He didn't say, I was once upon a time Alpha. I am Alpha. I am present right now. Right? <clears throat> Everywhere in the universe. And then, I am, someone said, Omega. And it's getting hot in here. <laughs> and so I got to be quick. And it's already 2 after 12. So I better shut up. Keep going. He says that I am Omega, right? He didn't say I will one day be Omega. I am Omega when? Now. now. Only present. How is it that God can take this Bible and tell us the future? Because he is he's there. I can tell you what's up because I'm looking at it right now. Mm -hmm. And I'm not the God of the dead. I'm the God of the living. God inhabits all of eternity. So he's omnipresent. He's omnipotent. And he knows everything. And folks don't think that God just has this linear existence like we have. We have a linear existence. We're only here for this moment in time. God is there too. But it's even more. Greater. Much greater. God inhabits all of eternity, right? So he's everywhere. So in other words, God says, I'm not necessarily in time. Time is inside of me. I'm not in space. Space is inside of me. God is bigger than what? Time and space. He can tell you what's going on because he's there. In the past, in the present, in the future. If he